everybody. Uh, welcome back to Psych Sync, Succinct Psychology. My name is Prescott, and today we're going to be starting Chapter 5, Sensation and Perception, in the Psychology 2E OpenStax PowerPoint image slideshow. So, without further ado, let's get going. So, first off, we have sensory systems. Our sensory systems are responsible for, for providing information about our surroundings, which allow us to successfully navigate and interact with our environments. So, if you for this picture, if you were standing in the midst of this street scene, you would be absorbing and processing numerous pieces of sensory input, because there's a whole lot going on there, so your senses would be a little overloaded. So, what is sensation, or what makes up sensation? So, first off, we have sensory receptors, which are specialized neurons that respond to specific types of stimuli. Now, sensation occurs when sensory receptors detect sensory stimuli. When sensory receptors detect the specific stimuli, it's like a tongue twister, I'm gonna slip up a lot this unit. <laughs> um, they convert that energy into an action potential which is sent to the central nervous system. This is called transduction. So, sensory systems are made up of vision, hearing or audition, smell, olfaction, taste, gustation, touch, som somatosensation, balance, vestibular sense, body position, proprioception, movement, kinesthesia, pain, nociception, and temperature, thermoception. And pretty much all of those have uh, ception at the end of them there. So perception, sensation, all that good stuff. So sensation, for a stimulus to cause an action potential, it first has to be strong enough to be detected. Now an absolute threshold is the minimum amount of stimulus energy that must be present for the stimulus to be detected 50% of the time. So on a clear night, the most sensitive sensory cells in the eye can detect a candle flame 30 miles away, which is crazy to think about. Uh, we are also able to receive messages presented below the threshold of consciousness awareness, which are known as subliminal messages. So the stimulus causes an action potential, but we are not consciously aware of it. That's a subliminal message. So next we have a just noticeable difference, or JND. The minimum difference in stimuli required to detect the change or difference between stimuli. So this can change depending on the stimulus intensity. So for example, a cell phone lighting up in a dark movie theater is more likely to be noticed than if it lights up in a brightly lit shopping mall. The brightness of the cell phone does not change, but the ability to detect the change in illumination does. As I'm sure if you've you know, been in a movie theater um, and somebody's gotten out their phone, you immediately notice it because it's a dark room with a bright phone going on. But walking around at daylight, you probably aren't gonna notice if somebody turns on their phone because it's the just noticeable difference. The JMD would be the minimum increase in brightness required for the change to be detected. Next, we have perception, which is our sensory receptors collect information about our environment, but it is then how we interpret that information that ultimately affects how we interact with the world. So perception is the way that sensory information is interpreted, organized, and consciously experienced. Perception involves two forms of processing. Bottom-up processing, which is a system in which perceptions are built from sensory input. So perception is built from you, how you, you know, sense things like the touch or the taste or the sound of it. And then we have top-down processing, which is interpretation of sensations is influenced by available knowledge, experiences, and thoughts. So Here's a nice little chart. So top-down processing occurs when previous experience and expectations are first used to rec recognize stimuli. And bottom-up uh, occurs when we sense basic features of stimuli and then integrate them. So I can think of uh, top-down, an example would be that you smell a certain smell and it reminds you of a previous experience or previous sensation and so that's how you recognize the stimuli. You're like, oh, that smells like this, and I know it from my previous experience. And then again, bottom up is just, you know, you sense the basic features of the stimuli and you integrate them into your perception. So factors affecting perception. So first we have sensory adaptation, and that is not perceiving stimuli that remain relatively consist constant over prolonged periods of time. For example, when you first enter a quiet room, you may hear the clock ticking. Over time, you become unaware of the ticking. The ticking is still affecting your sensory receptors, but you are no longer perceiving the sound because you've gotten used to it, you've gotten accustomed to it. 
So then we have attention. So first we have inattentional blindness. So it's failure to notice something that is completely visible because of a lack of attention. So in this picture here, we have nearly one third of participants in a study did not notice that a red cross passed on the screen because their attention was focused on the black or white figures. So when we look at this, you know, you're, this is a still image, so clearly you notice the red cross, but if it was a screen scrolling past you, and for a while it was nothing but black and white figures, you might not notice the red cross because you're focused on the black and white figures, and the red cross is so just not what you're focusing on. It's not the focus of your attention. So next we have factors affecting perception. So we have, well, continuing, not next. Um, but we have motivation. So sometimes we think we hear something, such as a phone ringing, when it is not because we are motivated to perceive it, such as waiting for an important phone call, or same thing, you know, you're waiting for a text from somebody. You might be, oh, did my phone just buzz? But it didn't. But, but that's because the reason you thought it was is because you're motivated to perceive it. You're waiting to hear that, that phone ring or the vibration. And with that, we have signal detection theory, which is change in stimulus detection as a function of your current mental state. So again, that's that eagerness, your mental state is you really waiting for that phone call or text, and so it changes your stimulus detection. Next, we have beliefs, values, prejudices, and expectations. So people who hold positive attitudes towards low-fat foods are more likely to rate foods with low-fat labels as tasting better than people with less positive attitudes about low-fat products. So that's a nice example of how your beliefs, values, prejudices, and expectations affect your perception. And next we have life slash cultural experiences. So one study found that people from Western cultures where there is a perceptual context of buildings with straight lines were more likely to experience certain types of visual illusions like the Mueller, Mueller, because it's supposed to have an umlaut, I'm pretty sure, uh, Lear illusion than individuals from non-Western cultures where they are more likely to live in round huts. So see the umlaut, that's what I was talking about. But the, we'll just say molar, just to make it easier. So the molar Lear illusion. So in the molar Lear illusion, lines appear to be different lengths, although they are identical. So arrows at the end of lines may make the line on the right appear longer, although the lines are the same length. So right here, because of the direction of the arrows, it's making the right line, because you know, as long as you're from the Western culture, uh, if you're not, maybe this doesn't affect you. But because of the shape of the arrows, where they're pointing, it's making this line appear longer than this line, even though they're both the same length. And figure B, when applied to a three-dimensional image, the line on the right again may appear longer, although both black lines are the same length. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but it definitely, to me, looks like lines on the right are longer than the ones on the left, but that's the illusion. You know, I'm from a Western culture. I'm used to architecture with straight lines, so that's probably why. So, um, well, actually, I don't want this first part to go on too long, um, but we do have a good number of slides, so I'll finish up with amplitude and wavelength. So, visual and auditory stimuli both occur in the form of waves. So two physical properties of waves are amplitude, right here, and wavelength, shown here. The amplitude or height of a wave is measured from the peak to the trough. The wavelength is measured from peak to pink. So amplitude height, wavelength is the distance between peak to peak. So we will go more into wavelengths, uh, starting with frequency, in the next video. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed learning about you know, different types of processing, sensation, perception. Um, we will continue with frequency in the next video. Again, this is Psych Sync, Sync Psychology. Uh, my name is Prescott, and I will hopefully see you guys in the next video. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hey everybody, welcome back to Unit 5 from the uh, OpenStack Psychology 2E lecture slides. My name is Prescott, I'm here at PsychSync, Sync Psychology, and we're going to be continuing where we left off. Um, last time we talked about sensation and perception, we started to go over uh, amplitude and wavelength. Again, amplitude is the height from the peak to the trough of each wave, 
and then wavelength is the distance from each peak of the individual waves. So we're going to continue from there and start talking about frequency. So wavelength is directly related to frequency. Uh, frequency is the number of waves that pass a given point in a given time period and is expressed in hertz or hz. So longer wavelengths have lower frequencies and shorter wavelengths have higher frequencies. So this figure illustrates waves of differing wavelengths slash frequencies. At the top of the figure, the red wave has a long wavelength and short frequency. So you can see how long the wavelengths are. So moving from the top to the bottom, the wavelengths decrease and frequencies increase. So by the time you get to the blue right there, you can see how frequent the wavelengths are. So light waves, the visible, visible spectrum is the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see. So different species can see different portions of the spectrum. Humans can see wavelengths ranging from about 380 to 740 nm. So see here, nice graph, wavelength, um, frequency, and tells you about the size. So here we have atomic nuclei, which obviously humans can't see, uh, unless you're Superman or something. Then we have atoms, x-ray wavelengths, molecules, ultraviolet, protozoans are the vis is where visible is, uh, pinpoints, infrared, honeybees, and then humans and buildings. So I don't know if it's saying that pinpoints, like, like a small, it looks like, like a needle or a button. So this is about where we can start to see. So these are wavelengths that we can perceive. We can't see molecules and atoms. So... Figure 5.6, light is as visible to humans makes up only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Again, we're kind of all the way down here where there's all this stuff. So, perception of color. Wavelength and color. Uh, different wavelengths of light are associated with our perception of different colors. So, longer wavelengths equal reds. And intermediate wavelengths are greens, and shorter wavelengths are blues and violets. So, the amplitude of light waves is associated with brightness slash intensity of color, so larger amplitudes appear brighter. Going on from light waves, we have sound waves. So frequency of sound waves equals the pitch. So high frequency equals high pitch sound. Low frequency equals low pitch sound. The audible range of sound frequencies in humans is between 20 and 2,000 hertz. So amplitude in decibels. So the amplitude of sound, wave, the amplitude of sound waves equals loudness. Uh, higher amplitude, louder sounds. Lower amplitude, quieter sounds. So loudness is measured in decibels, dB. So a typical conversation is about 60 decibels. A uh, rock concert, about 120 decibels. And the potential for hearing damage is 80 to 130 decibels. So if you go to a rock concert, you might get some hearing damage. And the threshold for pain is 130 decibels. So continuing with sound waves, we have a nice chart here. This figure illustrates the loudness of common sound. So your hearing threshold obviously would start at zero, and it goes all the way up in each picture. You know, cars at 80 decibels, uh, you know, river running, 20 decibels, whisper about 30, soft music 40, and it goes up to, here's your risk of hearing loss, again, at 130, to rock concert, to jets flying overhead is about, is the same as the pain threshold. And at 140 decibels is when it's just harmful for your hearing and your ears. Next, we have vision. So our eyes take in sensory information that helps us to understand the world around us. So nice bunch of pictures of eyes. Um, we will go into, well, no, we got plenty of time. I don't know why I thought we were going for so long. Um, so continuing with the visual system. Uh, the anatomy of the visual system. So light waves are transmitted across the cornea and enter through the pupil. The pupil size, so here you go, pupil, is controlled by muscles that are connected to the iris, the colored part of the eye. So I have, I don't know, like greenish blue eyes. Um, so that's the color of your eyes is your iris. Anyways, um, the light crosses the lens right here and is focused on the fovea, which is part of the retina. So the fovea, the fovea contains photoreceptors. Photoreceptors are connected to the retinal ganglion cells. Uh, axons from these cells exit through the back of the eye where they form the octave nerve, optic nerve. The optic nerve then carries the visual information to the brain. So that's how the visual system works. It goes from you know, pupil all the way to optical nerve. So blind spot, 
is a point of no receptors where information exits the eye where we cannot respond to visual information. And I actually uh, saw this cool thing on Instagram where it was like three dots and the middle dot was red and it was like, oh, well, this will show you your eye, your eye's blind spot, focus on the black dot for 30 seconds and then move in closely, the phone close to your face and the red spot disappeared. Like I couldn't see it anymore even though I knew it was right there. It was really cool. So that's a blind spot. So we have a more in-depth look at the visual system. Kind of nasty. Uh, next, we have photoreceptors. So photoreceptors, cones, which are phototopic or daytime vision, work best in bright light conditions. Obviously daytime, normally bright. Um, it's high acuity color information and is located in the fovea. Now rods are scotopic or nighttime vision and they work best in low light conditions. They have high sensitivity and allows for low acuity vision in dim light. And it is involved in the perception of movement in our peripheral vision. So it's located in the periphery, you know, the edge of the retina. So the two types of photoreceptors are shown in this image. Rods are colored green and cones are blue. So here you go, rods and cones. Next, we have the optic chiasm. Chiasm. Huh. Uh, the optic nerve of each eye merges at the optic chiasm, an X-shaped structure just below the cerebral cortex. So information from the right visual field is sent to the left hemisphere, and information from the left visual field is sent to the right hemisphere. This information is then sent to the occipital lobe for processing. So this illustration shows the optic chiasm at the front of the brain and the pathways to the occipital lobe at the back of the brain, where visual sensations are processed in a meaningful perception. So see the eye, right eye, is absorbing light information. So it goes to the left hemisphere and vice versa for the left eye. And those go to the opposite below where your visual sensations, you know, so what you see are processed into meaningful perceptions, which could, for example, um, with this process, uh, you see a line, you know, it goes through your optic chiasm to the occipital lobe, and then you uh, process that into a meaningful perception, which is, oh crap, there's a line right in front of me. So, it's a little example. So, visual pathways. After being processed in the occipital lobe, visual information exits and goes through two different pathways. So, we have the what pathway, which is object recognition and object identification, and the where slash how pathway. So, location and space, and how one might interact with a particular visual stimulus. So, color vision. So, you have two theories for color vision. The trichromatic theory of color vision, which is all colors can be produced by combining red, green, and blue. It applies to the retina, where color vision is controlled by three types of cones. So, opponent process theory. Color is coded in opponent pairs. So, you know, black and white, yellow and blue, green and red. Some cells are excited by one of the opponent colors and are inhibited by the other, and this applies to cells after the retina. Research has found that both theories are true, but for different parts of the visual system. So, this figure illustrates the different sensitivities for the three cone types found in a normal sighted individual. So, there you go there, that's color vision. Now, here we have support for the opponent process theory. So, when staring at a colored stimulus, the colored pairings of the opponent process theory lead to a negative afterimage. So, an afterimage is a continuation of a visual sensation after removal of the stimulus. So, stare at the white dot, this little fun thing you can do. Um, so, stare at the white dot for 30 to 60 seconds and then move your eyes to a blank piece of white paper. What do you see? And if you guys want, you can leave in the comments what you see. I didn't do it myself, and I'm not going to because I don't want to just be staring for 30 seconds to a minute. So if you guys are interested, you can do that. So next we have depth perception. Now depth perception is our ability to perceive spatial relationships in 3D. So depth cues of a visual scene are used to establish our sense of depth. So depth cues are that you have binocular cues, or cues that rely on the use of both eyes, so by two. Um, so binocular disparity, 
slightly different view of the world that each eye receives. And we have monocular cues, cues that rely on only one eye, so mono, one. So you have a linear perspective is when two parallel lines seem to converge and interposition, the partial overlap of objects. So here's an example. We perceive depth in a two-dimensional figure like this one through the use of monocular cues like linear perspective. Again, when two parallel lines seem to converge. And so like the parallel lines converging as the road narrows in the distance. And so that's how we're able to perceive depth in this picture because we see these two parallel lines being closer together. We're able to tell, oh, that's in the background. And here we have a little, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's a little like test of colorblindness. And it's, you know, can you distinguish the numbers in the middle of all these dots that are different colors from the, the background, the rest of the dots? So here you have, well, I don't want to spoil it for you, but yeah, if you can't um, see, anyways, if you can't see the numbers in the center, you might have some kind of colorblindness, fun fact. Next we have, um, well, we'll go through the auditory system in the next video. Um, again, my name is Prescott here at Psych Sync, so Sync Psychology, and we are going to continue going through the uh, OpenStack Psychology 2E lecture slides in the next video. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks, bye. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the um, OpenStack Psychology 2E Unit 5. My name is Prescott. I'm here at PsychSync, or Sync Psychology. And last time we talked a good bit about visual pathways, the optic chiasm, photoreceptors, the anatomy of the visual system, all that good stuff. And today we're, we're going to start with the anatomy of the auditory system. So the ear is divided into three divisions, the pinna and tympanic membrane. So you can see right here, pinna, tympanic membrane, this kind of weird oval shaped thing. Uh, we have the middle ear, which the three ossicles, or the malleus, incus, and stapes. You can see right here, a little zoom in of it, malleus, incus, stapes. Then we have the inner ear, which is the cochlea, right here, and the basilar membrane, and the hair cells. So, going on with that, we have a more in-depth illustration of the anatomy of the auditory systems, and it, again, highlights what makes up the ex external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. So, moving on, we have auditory transduction. So, sound waves travel along the auditory canal or canal and strike the tympanic membrane, causing it to vibrate. The vibration causes the three ossicles to move. This presses the stapes into the oval window of the cochlea. The fluid inside the cochlea begins to move, stimulating the hair cells, sensory receptors for sound, which become activated. The hair cells generate neural impulses that travel along the auditory nerve to the brain. Auditory information is sent to the inferior colliculus, then the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and finally to the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe for processing. So that's auditory transduction. Uh, pretty complicated there, isn't it? Next, we have pitch perception. So how does the auditory system differentiate among various pitches? So we have two theories here. We have temporal theory, which is frequency is coded by the activity level of a sensory neuron, but there's a problem, and that is the frequency of action potentials cannot account for the entire range that we are able to hear. There's a point at which a cell simply cannot fire any faster. Next, we have place theory. So different portions of the basilar membrane are sensitive to sounds of different frequencies. The base responds to high frequencies and the tip responds to low frequencies. Both theories explain different aspects of pitch perception. So the rate of action potentials applies up to about 4,000 hertz, but higher frequencies can only be encoded using place cues. All right, next we have sound localization. So localizing sound involves the use of two cues. Monaural mon cues, I almost said monaural, um, so it means one ear, and each ear interacts with incoming sound waves differently. Then we have bin binaural cues, which is two ears, and provide information on the location of sound along a horizontal axis, so flat axis. 
It relies on differences in patterns of vibration. So we have inter interaural level difference, which is sound coming from one side of the body is more intense at the closest ear because of the attenuation of the sound wave as it passes through the head. And then we have interaural timing difference, which is small difference in the time at which a given sound wave arrives at each ear. And so these two uh, differences are depicted here. So in this figure, jets are flying overhead. So the level difference, the closest ear is going to be more, the sound is going to be more intense in that ear that's closer to the origin of the sound. And then the timing difference, that ear that is closest is going to receive the sound before the ear that is facing away from the sound. Next, we have hearing loss. So deafness is the partial or complete inability to hear, and congenital deafness is deafness from birth. Then we have conductive hearing loss, which is associated with a failure in the vibration of the eardrum and or movement of the ossicles. ossicles. Um, can often be dealt with using hearing aids, which amplify incoming sound waves to make vibration of the eardrum and movement of the ossicles more likely to occur and it can be caused by age, genetic predisposition, environmental effects, exposure to extreme noise, certain illnesses, or damage due to toxins. So sensory neural hearing loss is the failure to transmit neural signals from the cochlea to the brain. And it can be caused by Meniere's, I might be saying that wrong, um, disease, which results in a degeneration of inner ear structures, which obviously is not good, your ear is kind of important. So here we have conductive hearing loss. So environmental factors that can lead to conductive hearing loss include regular exposure to loud music or construction of the, uh, equipment. So, you know, figure A, loud music. Figure B, construction zone uh, sounds. If you've never been on the construction zone before, it can get very, very loud and to the point where it's painful. Um, you know, construction workers, obviously, because of that, are at risk for this type of hearing loss. Going on from hearing, we have taste or gustation. Uh, research demonstrates that we have about six groupings of taste. And these are sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami. Right? It's associated with a taste for monosodium glutamate. And then the sixth one is some research suggests we possess a taste for the fatty content of food. Uh, taste buds are groupings of taste receptor cells with hair-like extensions that protrude into the central pore of the taste bud they have a half-life cycle of 10 days to two weeks. Now, transduction of taste is taste molecules bind to receptors and cause chemical changes within the sensory cell. These changes result in neural impulses being sent to the brain. So here we have a visualization. So taste buds are composed of a number of individual taste receptor cells, as you can see here, that transmit information to the nerves. So tongue surface, taste pores, so you're eating something, that's where your taste receptor cells detect the taste and it sends nerves to transmit information to the brain. So this micrograph, figure B, shows a close-up view of the tongue surface. So this is a little cartoon drawing, but this is what it actually looks like, which looks kind of gross, if I'm being honest. Next, we have smell or olfaction. So olfactory receptor cells contain small hair-like extensions which serve as the site for odor molecules to interact with chemical receptors located on these extensions, located in a mucous membrane at the top of the nose. So here we have the olfactory receptors, it's the nasal cavity, so inside your nose, and there's the olfactory bulb. So, transduction of smell. Odor molecules bind to receptors. Chemical changes cause signals to be sent to the olfactory bulb, right there, where the olfactory nerves begin. Inform information is sent to the limbic system and primary olfactory cortex. Now, pheromones are chemical messages sent by another individual. Many species respond to pheromones sent by another individual, uh, and they, are usually they usually communicate information about the reproductive status of a potential mate. Next, you know, just going down list of uh, senses, we have touch. So there are many types of sensory receptors located in the skin, each attuned to specific touch-related stimuli. So we have Meisner's corpse, corp skulls, corpy skulls, I don't know how to say that properly, um, respond to pressure and lower frequency vibrations. We have Pacinian corp skulls, which, are, which detect transient pressure and higher frequency vibrations, so Meisner's and Pacinian. Then we have Merkel's discs, 
right here, which respond to light pressure graphene corpuscles, which detect a stretch. And I, you know, when I first looked at this, I was like, oh yeah, it kind of looks like something that you would pull on and stretch apart like a, like a plastic toy or something, or a rubber toy, I should say. Next, we have thermoception and nociception. So as well as receptors located in the skin, there are a number of free nerve endings that have sensory functions. So thermoception is temperature perception, thermo, temperature, like a thermometer. Um, nociception is the sensory signal indicating potential harm and maybe pain. This type of sensory information travels up the spinal cord directly to the brain, specifically the medulla, thalamus, and the somatosensory cortex. Next, we have pain perception. So pain perception is important because it motivates us to remove ourselves from the cause of injury. So inflammatory pain, like arthritis, uh, signals some type of tissue damage. And then you have neuropathic pain, which is caused by damage to neurons of either the peripheral or the central nervous system. Now, congenital insensitivity to pain is a rare genetic disorder in which the individual is born without the ability to feel pain. Um, they can detect differences in temperature and pressure, but they cannot experience pain. And uh, individuals are at greater risk of injury and have shorter life expectancies when they have congenital insensitivity to pain. Um, and I actually remember one of my, you know, learning about this with one of my professors showed a video of this guy who had congenital insensitivity to pain and how he would, you know, fall or like he was just constantly getting bruised or hurt because he couldn't feel the pain. And so he wouldn't know that anything was wrong. So it's not good. Um, so next we have the vestibular sense, which is our ability to maintain body posture. And this is weird, it's uh, kind of cut off. So I'll just go on to the next slide because I'm only getting half of the, uh, the words. I don't want it to be broken. But here you have um, vestibular sense, like the, uh, it's in your ear because you can see the cochlea, basilar membranes, the inner ear. So the vestibular sense, the maculae are specialized for sensing, you can see right here, maculae, for sensing linear acceleration, such as when gravity acts on the tilting head, or if the head starts moving in a straight line. So here you have head tilted forward, and here you have a head upright. Difference in inertia between the hair cell stereocilia and otholithic membrane in which they are embedded leads to a shearing force that causes the stereocilia to bend in the direction of the linear acceleration. So here you have the head tilted forward. It's causing the stereocilia to bend forward because of the force of gravity. Whereas when your head is upright, like mine is right now, they stay level. So we will finish up unit five in the next video. Um, we will go on to proprioception and kinesthesia, and then we will finish up unit five. But I hope you guys enjoyed. Again, my name is Prescott here at Psych Sinks, the Sink Psychology. And I hope to see you in the next video where we finish up Unit 5 of the OpenStack Psychology 2E uh, lecture slides. Thank you and have a great day. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Prescott. I'm at Psych Sinks, the Sink Psychology, and we are going to finish up Unit 5 from the OpenStack Psychology 2E lecture slides. Uh, last time, quick reminder, we talked about all these different senses, such as touch, smell, hearing, you know, stuff you've heard about before, but kind of went in-depth about the different parts of each uh, sense, basically. So we're going to keep on keeping on here with uh, proprioception and kinesthesia. Now, the vestibular system, which is, again, like your sense of balance and whatnot, also collects information important for controlling movement and reflexes that move parts of our bodies to compensate for changes in body position. Both proprioception and kinesthesia interact with information... Oh, whoops. There we go. Uh, interact with information provided by the vestibular system. So, proprioception is the perception of body posi position, and then, you know, it has section in the, uh, in the word, perception of body position. And then you have kinesthesia, which is perception of the body's movement through space. This information travels to the brain via the spinal column, 
and information from the brain is then sent to the sensory organs of the proprioceptive and kinesthetic systems. Now we have Gestalt, and that should be, you know, Gestalt psychology, but throw back to Unit 1, uh, Gestalt principles of perception. So, Gestalt, Gestalt psychology, as a quick reminder, is the field of psychology based on the idea that the whole is different from the sum of its parts. So, here, the brain creates a perception that is more than simply the sum of available sensory inputs. The brain does this in predictable ways, which Gestalt psychologists translated into principles by which we organize sensory information. Principles include figure-ground relationship, proximity, similarity, continuity, and closure. So we'll go into more in depth into each of those, starting off with figure-ground relationship. And this is the idea that we tend to segment our visual world into figure and ground. Figure is the focus of the visual field and ground is the background. And our perception can vary depending on what we view as a figure and what we view as ground. So the concept of figure-ground relationship explains why this image right here can be perceived either as a vase or as a pair of faces. And for me, when I look at it, I see a pair of faces. So that's, for me, the figure, the focus of the visual field are these two faces, but you might see a vase. So it varies from person to person. So next we have the, you know, the gestalt principle of proximity, which is the idea that things are close to one another tend to be grouped together. So the gestalt principle of proximity suggests that you see in figure A, one block of dots on the left side, and B, three columns, three individual columns on the right side. Next we have the gestalt principle of similarity. So the idea that things are, that are alike tend to be grouped together. So here, when looking at this array of dots, we likely perceive alternating rows of colors. So instead of seeing, you know, uh, one long row where it's just, you know, well, you, yeah, you see alternating colors, alternating rows. So you see yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue. Next, we have the Gestalt principle of continuity. So the idea that we are more likely to perceive continuous, smooth flowing lines rather than jagged, broken lines. So good continuation would suggest that we are more likely to perceive this as two overlapping lines rather than four lines meeting in the center. And yeah, I perceive this as two lines that overlap, not four different short lines that just meet in the middle. And next we have the Gestalt principle of closure. So closure suggests that we will perceive a complete circle and rectangle rather than a series of segments. And again, I don't know about you guys, but I see, yeah, it's like an incomplete circle. Not incomplete, a complete circle, but it's just kind of broken up in a rectangle rather than just a bunch of individual lines. And this is another little throwback to Unit 1, but duck or rabbit. So take a look at the following figure. How might you influence whether people see a duck or rabbit? So, you know, think about that and leave the response in the comments. And finally, this is a pretty short video. I just didn't want to last one to go on too long. Um, we have implicit bias and perception. So perception is built from senses and influenced by experiences, biases, and culture. Dr. Atiba Goss research showed that black boys are considered more responsible for their actions than white boys of the same age. So, in the study, 264 university students, mostly white females, involved, were involved in the study. As a group, they overestimated the age of black children by 4.5 years. So, a black 12-year-old may seem 15 or even 16 years old. And they also judged black children over the age of 10 as significantly less innocent than white children of the same age. So, a little question for you to end off the unit. What might this say about law enforcement, educational, and jury perceptions of defendants of different races? And so, you know, give that a little thought. And again, you can leave a comment uh, saying what you think about that. But, you know, short video, but just wanted to wrap it up without having part three uh, or four, I can't remember, uh, be too long. I was pretty sure it's part three. Um, so, anyways, that was Unit 5 from the OpenStax Psychology 2E uh, lecture slides. Again, my name is Prescott uh, here at PsychSync, Succinct Psychology, and I hope you guys enjoyed this unit, and I hope to see you for the next one. Thank you very much, and have a great day.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psych Psychology. Um, my name is Prescott, and once again, I'm here at Psych And today, we are going to continue the Psychology 2E OpenStax textbook with Chapter 6 Learning. So, let's get started. So, what is learning? So, a loggerhead sea turtle hatchlings, or loggerhead sea turtle hatchlings, are born knowing how to find the ocean and how to swim. Unlike the sea turtle, humans must learn how to swim and surf. Um, as humans, we pride ourselves on our ability to learn. So, what processes are at work as we come to know what we know? So, here you got a little loggerhead sea turtle, kids surfing. So, unlearned behaviors are compromised of instincts and reflexes. Now, instincts and reflexes are innate behaviors that organisms are born with. They help organisms adapt to their environment. Now, reflexes are motor slash neural reactions to a specific stimulus. They are simpler than instincts and involve activity of specific body parts and involve primitive centers of the central nervous system, example, spinal cord and medulla. So, for example, human babies are born with a sucking reflex, where if you, you know, put something at the edge of their mouth, they'll automatically turn towards it to suck on it. That's their reflex. Now, an instinct is a behavior triggered by a broader range of events. So, aging, change of seasons. Now, these are more complex and involve movement of the organism as a whole. So, sexual activity and migration. That's not just a single body part like reflexes. It's your whole, the whole organism. And they also involve higher brain centers, so it requires a bit more brain power. Now, what is learning? So learning also helps organisms adapt to their environment, but learned behaviors involve change and experience. Now, learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior or knowledge that results from experience. This involves acquiring skills slash knowledge through experience and involves conscious and unconscious processes. Now, associative learning is when an organism makes connections between stimuli or events that occur together in the environment. There are many approaches to learning, and we will look at approaches that are part of behaviorism. So classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning, which you guys might remember we've touched in previous units. So it'll be a little bit of a refresher, but we'll go a bit more in detail. Now, right here in operant conditioning, if you guys remember, a response is associated with a consequence. This dog has learned that certain behaviors result in receiving a treat. So here you can see the dog pointing, because they know they'll get a treat. Now, classical conditioning. Ivan Pavlov's research on the digestive system of dogs unexpectedly led to his disco discovery of the learning process now known as classical conditioning. Now, classical conditioning is a process by which we learn to associate stimuli and, consequently, to anticipate events. So Pavlov noticed that dogs salivated not only at the taste of food, but also at the footsteps of the lattice lab assistant's footsteps. He realized that organisms have two types of responses to its environment unconditioned or unlearned responses, and conditioned or learned responses. In the most famous example, dogs were conditioned to associate the sound of a bell with food. When the dogs heard the bell, they anticipated food and began to salivate. So how does classical conditioning occur? Maybe you guys remember, but if not, we'll go over again. All right, so first off, before conditioning, there's the unconditioned stimulus, or the UCS, which is a stimulus that elicits a reflexive response. So in this circumstance, it'd be the food. And an unconditioned response, which is the UCR, is a natural but unlearned reaction to a stimulus. So salivation response to food. That's the UCR. Now, and, you know, nice little picture here. So food or the UCS leads to the unconditioned response, salivation. Now, during conditioning, there's a neutral stimulus, stimulus NS, and the stimulus that does not naturally elicit a response. So in Pavlov's case, ringing a bell does not cause salivation by itself prior to conditioning. So the neutral stimulus and unconditioned stimulus are paired repeatedly. So you add the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned to get salivation. Now after conditioning, the conditioned stimulus, CS, is a stimulus that elicits a response after repeatedly being paired with an unconditioned stimulus. And the condition response is the behavior caused by the condition stimulus. So after conditioning, the bell is the condition stimulus, which triggers the condition response of salivation, because the dog has associated the ringing of the bell with food. So now it salivates at the ringing of the bell. Going further, or nice little picture, just to break it down easier if you don't want to look at all those words. So the dog salivates on condition response in response to food. The, I'm just going to say UCS and UCR so it doesn't take so long. 
And then, so this is before conditioning, and the dog does not salivate in response to the bell. Now the bell, NS, and food, UCS, are paired during conditioning, and after conditioning, just the sound of the bell alone is enough to cause the dog to salivate. Now, one second, sorry. Now, high order conditioning. So high order conditioning is an established conditioned stimulus is paired with a new neutral stimulus, the second order stimulus, so that eventually the new stimulus also elicits the conditioned response without the initial conditioned stimulus being presented. So example, the cat is conditioned to salivate when it hears the electric can opener. The squeaky cabinet door, which is a second order stimulus, is paired with the can opener. And the cat salivates when it hears the squeaky cabinet door. So the cat learns to associate the cabinet door with the electric can opener and therefore with food. So originally you have the conditioned stimulus of the can opener with the unconditioned stimulus, the food it elicits the unconditioned response, but there's a second order stimulus, so you know, squeaky cabinet door being opened to grab the electric can opener and it causes the conditioned response of salivation. So eventually, the second order stimulus by itself will be enough to make the cat salivate. I don't know if you guys have pets or cats at home, but like not even trying, my cats back home are conditioned to when you go into the room where their food bowls are, they automatically run to their food bowls and like start meowing at you and waiting for you to give them food because they know if you go in there, that means you're getting food. So that would be a second order stimulus though going into the room. So general processes in classical conditioning. So first there's acquisition, which is the initial period of learning when an organism learns to connect a neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. Usually this requires there to be a very short time interval between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus for the pairing to be repeated multiple times. Sometimes conditioning can occur when the interval is up to several hours and the pairing occurs only once example, taste aversion. Now, extinction is a decrease in the conditioned response when the unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented with the conditioned stimulus. So, if food stops being presented with the sound of the bell, then eventually the dog will stop responding to the bell. That's extinction. Now, spontaneous recovery is the return of a previously extinguished conditioned response following a rest period. So, maybe after a little bit of time, the conditioned response comes back. So here we have the curve of acquisition, extinction, and spontaneous recovery. So the rising curve shows the conditioned response quickly getting stronger through the repeated pairing of the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Acquisition right here, CS plus UCS. Then the curve decreases, which shows how the conditioned response weakens when only the conditioned stimulus is presented, extinction. So conditioned stimulus alone, no longer paired with the unconditioned stimulus. But after a break or pause from conditioning, the condition re response <laughs> appears, spontaneous recovery. So right here, this is spontaneous recovery of the condition response and extinction when it's alone. So distinguishing between stimuli, organisms need to be able to distinguish between different stimuli in order to respond appropriately. So stimulus discrimination is when an organism learns to respond differently to various stimuli that are similar. So the dog can discriminate between the specific bell sound that signals food and a similar bell sound that does not signal food. Stimulus generalization is when an organism demonstrates the condition response to stimuli that are similar to the conditioned stimulus. So if an individual learns to dislike a specific spider, they will usually then dislike all spiders because they generalize. Oh, you know, for example, you should be scared of black widows. Well, if you teach that to a little kid, maybe they'll interpret that as, oh, I need to be scared of all spiders because they generalize, oh, it has eight legs, small, fangs, eyes, all that stuff. Now, classical conditioning can also lead to habituation. Now, habituation is learning not to respond to a stimulus that is presented repeatedly without change. So as a stimulus is repeated, we learn not to focus our attention on it. So that could be, for example, the whirring of a fan. You know, when you first walk into a room, you might notice the whirring of the fan. It might be like a really loud fan, but over time, you habituate to it, you get used to it, and you no longer are aware of that stimulus. It's become background noise. So going on, next we have behaviorism. Again, a little throwback. So John B. Watson used the principles of classical conditioning in the study of human emotion, and he believed that all behavior could be studied as a stimulus-response reaction. 
He believed the principles of classical conditioning could be used to condition human emotions. And he conducted a famous study, which I'm sure you guys have at least heard about, called, well, with a little boy called Little Albert. And we will stop the video here for today. We will continue Unit 6 later. Um, again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Sinks, the Sink Psychology. And I hopefully will see you guys in the next video so we can continue with Chapter 6 of the OpenStax 2E online textbook. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Unit 6 Learning of the OpenStax 2E online textbook. Again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Succinct Psychology, or PsychSynced. And we are going to continue where we left off in the last video. In the last video, we went over what exactly is learning, and we reviewed and went more in depth about classical conditioning. And so now we are going to start where we left off last time. We briefly went over behaviorism, John B. Watson, and we are going to discuss his study of Little Albert. So, Little Albert. So Watson exposed Little Albert to certain stimuli and conditioned him to fear them. So he was presented with neutral stimuli, like a rabbit, dog, cotton, wool, a white rat, etc. So Watson then paired these with a loud sound every time little Albert touched the stimulus that caused him to feel fear. After repeated pairings, little Albert became fearful of the stimulus alone, such as the white rabbit. Although initially conditioned to fear specific stimuli, they were all furry and therefore through stimulus generalization, and remember that's like, you know, when you're taught oh, you should fear this one spider, and you end up fearing all spiders because you generalize. Um, little Albert came to fear furry things, including Watson in a Santa Claus mask, which you can see here. Um, there's no evidence whether Little Albert's fear was long-lasting or not, which this study would not be able to be conducted today. It is not ethical to uh, teach a child to be terrified of everything cute and fluffy. So going on, we have operant conditioning. Which is, and operant conditioning is a theory proposed by D.F. Skinner. In operant conditioning, organisms learn to associate a behavior and its consequences with reinforcement or punishment, and it is based on the law of effect. Pleasant consequence slash desired result equals behavior is more likely to occur again. Now, an unpleasant consequence or an undesired result is behavior is less likely to occur again. And I'm sure you've all experienced this in your own personal lives. You know, you do good on a test, your parents or you win a football game or any kind of sport, your parents take you out to a nice dinner. That encourages you to continue that behavior, to do good on your next test, or do good in your next game or sport. Now, the unpleasant consequence or an undesired result would be getting your computer taken away or your Xbox taken away for a week because you failed an exam or you got bad grades or you did something bad at school or in the neighborhood, something like that. I'm sure that's happened to everybody, hopefully not just me. So, uh, our, well, for example, here, when we show up to work, which is behavior, we get paid, which is a pleasant consequence. So we continue to show up to work because we want to keep getting that pleasant consequence that resulted from our good behavior. So Skinner conducted experiments, mainly with rats and pigeons, to determine how learning occurs through operant conditioning. So operant, I can't talk today, sorry. Operant conditioning terminology. So you have positive, which is to add something, negative, which is to take something away, Reinforcement, which is increasing the behavior, you're reinforcing that behavior, and punishment, decreasing the behavior, trying to stop them from doing that behavior. So let's continue. So classical versus operant conditioning. So here are the two compared. So the conditioning approach for classical conditioning is an unconditioned stimulus, and again, we went over this last video, such as food is paired with a neutral stimulus, such as a bell. The neutral stimulus eventually becomes the conditioned stimulus, which brings about the conditioned response, salivation. Now, the conditioning approach for operant conditioning is the target behavior is followed by reinforcement or punishment to either strengthen or weaken it, so that the learner is more likely to exhibit the desired behavior in the future. Now, stimulus timing for classical conditioning is the stimulus occurs immediately before the response. Your stimulus is triggered before you elicit a response. But with operant conditioning, the stimulus, either reinforcement or punishment, occurs soon after the response. So classical before, operant after. So here we have the Skinner box. So to study operant conditioning, Skinner placed animals inside an operant conditioning chamber or Skinner box 
containing a lever that, when pressed, causes food to be dispensed as a reward. So, here you have Skinner, and here you have a picture of the Skinner box. So basically, it would train rats to, based on either light signals or sound cues, to push the lever a certain amount of times or after a certain sound in order to receive food. So that's how he trained it. He got that reward. And again, they get the, uh, the stimulus after the response. So reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is something is added to increase the likelihood of a behavior. So everyday examples are high grades, paychecks, and praise. Now negative reinforcement is something is removed to increase the likelihood of behavior. Remember, reinforcement doesn't mean like that can, I know that can get kind of confusing because you see, oh, negative reinforcement, you're trying to reinforce a negative behavior. No, it's just negative, again, means to take away something to increase the likelihood of the behavior. Negative is taking away, positive is adding. So negative reinforcement is just you're encouraging the behavior by taking away something. So an example would be the beeping sound that will only go away when you put your seatbelt on. So that, you know, annoying beeping sound, it's encouraging you to put on your belt so then you don't have to listen to that anymore. So it encourages the behavior of wearing your seatbelt. Now sticker charts are a form of positive reinforcement and a tool for behavior modification. Once this little girl earns a certain number of stickers for demonstrating a desired behavior, she will be rewarded with a trip to the ice cream parlor. So that is a positive reinforcement. She's adding the stickers in order to, well, she's adding the stickers because she wants to get that reward of getting ice cream which she gets from exhibiting good behaviors. Next, we have punishment. So positive punishment is something is added to decrease the likelihood of behavior. So for example, scolding a student for texting in class. Now negative punishment is something is removed to decrease the likelihood of the behavior. So taking away a favorite toy when a child misbehaves. So punishment, again, is you're decreasing. Reinforcement, increasing behavior, punishment, reducing the behavior. Positive is adding something to decrease that behavior. Negative is taking it away, just like the examples say. So another positive punishment could be, you know, you get, I don't know, spanked in order to try, you're adding in that physical punishment in order to discourage you cussing out your parents or something, right? So that's punishment. Now shaping is a tool used in operating conditioning. In shaping, instead of rewarding only the target behavior, we reward successive approximations of a target behavior. So behaviors are broken down into many small achievable steps and are useful when teaching a complex chain of events and commonly used by animal trainers. So first step, we reinforce any response that resembles the desired behavior. Second, they then reinforce the response that more closely resembles the desired behavior, no longer reinforce previously reinforced, reinforced response. Third, we then begin to reinforce the response that even more closely resembles the desired behavior. And step four, continue to do this until only the desired behavior is reinforced. And the way I think of it is, is like a pyramid. You know, you start off very wide and you narrow to the very top. So step one, you reinforce the base, any response that resembles your desired behavior. And each level, you're getting closer and closer to your desired behavior until you get the peak of the pyramid and that's your desired behavior, and then you just reinforce that. So it's, it differs from the punishment and reinforcement in the sense that it builds up to the desired behavior. It isn't just like, okay, I want you to get good grades immediately. It might be, oh, you get slightly better grades, slightly better grades. Like your parents want you to be getting all A's. You know, oh, well, you got B minuses this time around. That's pretty good, let's try and get better. And they build up, if that makes sense. Now, primary and secondary reinforcers are rewards to reinforce behavior, or rewards to reinforce behavior can come in many forms, so praise, stickers, money, toys, etc. Now, primary reinforcers are those that have innate reinforcing qualities, so food, water, sleep, sex, and pleasure. The value of these reinforcers does not need to be learned. You already know that food and water and sleep and all that is valuable. You need it. Now, secondary reinforcers are those that have no inherent value. Their value is learnt and becomes reinforcing when linked with a primary reinforcer. So praise, a secondary reinforcer, is linked with affection, a primary reinforcer. 
Money is only reinforcing when it can be used to buy other things, such as things that satisfy basic needs, food, or other secondary reinforcers. And tokens are a secondary reinforcer that can be exchanged for other things. Token economies are used in many settings to encourage correct behavior, such as prisons, schools, and mental institutions. So again, primary reinforcers, pretty straightforward, it's just stuff you innately know is valuable. And secondary, like money, has no value by itself, but what gives it value is how it's linked to a primary reinforcer. So, you know, you get $20, you value it because, oh, I can go buy some food, right? Then it becomes valuable. And then, let's see. We'll do this last slide and then I'll end the video for today. So, reinforcement schedules. The best way to teach behavior is with positive reinforcement. However, there are many ways that positive reinforcement can be administered. So continuous reinforcement is when an organism receives a reinforcer each time it displays a behavior. It is the quickest way to teach behavior. For example, a dog receives a treat every time it sits when it's told to. But timing is very important. The treat must be presented immediately after sitting in order for the dog to associate the target behavior with the consequence. However, if the trainer suddenly stops providing treats, the dog will stop sitting. So another type of reinforcement is then used once the behavior is learned. So continuous is for initially learning the behavior. And, and that is partial reinforcement. That's what you use after you stop giving the dog a treat every time they sit. The organism does not get reinforced every time they display the desired behavior. They are reinforced intermittently. So there are several types of partial reinforcement schedules. And we will start that on the next video. Um, again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at PsychSync, Succinct Psychology. This is uh, part two of the chapter six learning OpenStax 2E psychology textbook. And I hope you guys found it enjoyable and entertaining and maybe a little educational and hope you have a great day. See you soon, bye. Hey everybody, welcome back to Psych Synced or Succinct Psychology. My name is Prescott and we are going to finish up Unit 6 Learning from the OpenStax 2E online textbook. Last time we went over operant conditioning, the Skinner box, um, punishment and reward, not reward, reinforcement, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, and we ended here briefly going over reinforcement schedules and now we're going to continue by going over several types of partial reinforcement schedules because remember partial reinforcement is when you give the reinforcement intermittently or every once in a while, not every time the behavior is displayed. So let's go on. So fixed versus variable. Now fixed is the number of responses between reinforcements where the amount of time between reinforcements is set and unchanging. Now variable is the number of responses between reinforcements where the amount of time between reinforcements varies, excuse me, or changes. So then we have interval versus ratio. Interval is the schedule's base on the time, time between reinforcements. So ratio is the schedule's base on the number of responses between reinforcements. So interval is the time between and ratio is the number. So fixed interval is a reinforcement is delivered at, a, at predictable time intervals. So for example, patients take pain relief medication at set times. And variable interval is reinforcement is delivered at unpredictable time intervals. So checking Facebook, you don't, I mean, can't think of anybody that checks Facebook like oh, exactly every 30 minutes. Now fixed ratio is reinforcement is delivered after a predictable number of responses. So factory workers being paid for every X number of items manufactured. And variable ratio is reinforcement is delivered after an unpredictable number of responses. So gambling. So here we have partial reinforcement schedules. The four reinforcement schedules yield different response patterns. So the variable ratio schedule, unpredictable and yields high and steady response rates with little if any pause after reinforcement. So example, gambler. Here we have the variable ratio. Now fixed ratio right here, predictable and produces a high response rate with a short pause. You can see here is a brief pause after each reinforcement. So it's an like eyeglass, eyeglass saleswoman. Then we have variable interval schedule right here. Unpredictable and produces a moderate, you can see here it's not nearly as crazy as variable, uh, moderate steady response rate, so a restaurant manager. 
And finally, we have the fixed interval schedule. Yields a scallop-shaped response pattern reflecting a significant pause after reinforcement. So a surgery patient, you don't want to go right back into surgery. <laughs> All right, so gambling in the brain. Some research suggests that pathological gamblers use gambling to compensate for abnormally low levels of a hormone norepinephrine, which is associated with stress and is secreted in moments of arousal and thrill. So cognition and latent learning. So research conducted by Edward C. Tolman found that learning could still occur without reinforcement. This introduced the idea that there is a cognitive aspect to learning. While studying rats, he found that if you put them in a maze to learn their way through it, they would eventually form a cognitive map of it. A cognitive map is a mental picture of the layout of an environment. So after 10 sessions in the maze without food as reinforcement, food was placed at the exit, and the rats were able to very quickly exit the maze, showing that they had learned the way out. This is called latent learning. Now, latent learning is learning that occurs, but is not observable in behavior until there is a reason to demonstrate it. So children may learn behaviors from the parents that they do not demonstrate until they are older. A child may learn the route to school from watching his parent drive there, but will not demonstrate this until they can drive themselves or have to get there by bike or walking. I know I've definitely done that. <laughs> so here we have cognitive maps. So psychologist Edward Tolman found that rats use cognitive maps to navigate through a maze. Have you ever worked your way through various levels on a video game? And it's basically saying, you know, and I like to play video games a lot, and I play plenty of games where I have to know where I'm going, but I don't have like a map really to tell me. I have to use a cognitive map to be like, okay, take a left here, go up here, right here, down here, cross this thing. You're using a cognitive map if you've ever done that before, played video games like that. Next, we have observational learning or modeling. So right here, you see a spider monkey is copying or modeling the human right here to figure out how to drink water out of the bottle. So observational learning, some more examples. So example A, yoga students learn by observation as their yoga instructor demonstrates the correct stance and movement for her students. So example B, models can't have to, or don't have to be present for learning to occur. Through symbolic modeling, this child can learn a behavior by watching someone demonstrate it on television. So there you go, nice little insight to observational learning, not too much to it, just you observe another person, whether it's in person or through a TV, and you model their behavior. Now, social learning theory, in order to explain how learning occurred without external reinforcement, Albert Bandura proposed social learning theory. He believed that observational learning involved more than just imitation and that internal mental states must be involved. So steps in the modeling process. Step one, attention, focus on the behavior. Step two, retention, remember what you observed. Three is reproduction, be able to perform the behavior. And step four is motivation. You must want to copy the behavior. You have to have the motivation. So motivation depends on what happened to the model. Now vicarious reinforcement is a process where the observer sees the model rewarded, making the observer more likely to imitate the model's behavior. But vicarious punishment is a process where the observer sees the model punished, making the observer less likely to imitate the model's behavior. And so, famous example of this is Bandura's Bobo doll experiment. And like I just said there, in a famous study known as the Bobo doll experiment, Bandura studied modeling of aggressive and violent behaviors. So, children observed adults act aggressively toward a five-foot Bobo doll. The, chil the, not children, the adult was then either punished, praised, or ignored for their behavior, and the children were then given the opportunity to play with a Bobo doll. If the child had seen the adult punished, they were less likely to act aggressively towards the doll because they saw what had, would happen. If the child had seen the adult praised or ignored, they were more likely to imitate the adult. Bandura concluded that children watch and learn from the adults around them, which can have both pro-social and anti-social consequences, depending on what kind of environment they grew up in. So finally, last slide, can video games make us violent? Psychological researchers study this topic and suggest that there is a correlation between watching violence and aggression in children. So that's something you guys can think about after what we've learned today through modeling and social learning theory. Do you think that watching, you know, like if you were these kids and you're shooting bad guys and whatnot, do you think that this has merit? Do you think that children watching violence in video games could lead them to be more violent? Uh, leave that up to you guys to think about and discuss. 
But that was Unit 6. Bit of a quick one there. But uh, thank you guys for joining me. I hope you found it informative and at least not too boring. Again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Sync for Succinct Psychology. And that was Chapter 6 Learning from the OpenStax 2E Online Textbook. I uh, hope you guys have a great time or a great day. And I will see you in the next unit. Thanks. Bye.